Thank you. Thank you, Armand, for introducing me. I actually was introduced several times already, but I want to add some little details to what was already told about me. Since you already heard, I'm working at UNO almost two years already, and since that time I worked with everything that we have. So I started with writing tests and documentations for our backend project, and then I learned Kubernetes to help to migrate our project from Docker Cloud that doesn't exist anymore to Google Cloud Platform. And that was when I was still an intern there. And when I started as a full-time employee, I was tackling the front-end tasks uh, while we was updating our web company site. And right now, I'm part of a mobile team, and we are developing a hybrid mobile application. Um, actually, last year, I was one of the organizers uh, of the course. So I was looking for a place and uh, also bringing everything up together. And I wasn't brave enough to give a lecture myself. But today I'm here and I'm, I shared my story I'm really proud of. And I'm pretty sure since I was able to do this and contribute to all of it, you will be able to do this too. So I'm a real example that everything is possible. And this time I'm on the other side. I'm not an assistant or student there, but I'm a teacher. And it's my first big event when I'm presenting in front of such a huge crowd. Um, I'm really happy to be here, so thank you for having me today. I don't know if we need to ask again who still have problems with MongoDB, so our teaching assistant can, could rush to your place and help you. But it will be really nice because we will cover a lot of topics today and it's really important to be on the same page. And also make sure that you pulled all the changes from our GitHub. So you should see the big five folder in your uh, Visual Studio code. And also if you made it yesterday, please uh, pull it again because we added some changes uh, this morning. Um, yeah. So. Please raise your hands if you still don't have a full changes or still didn't have MongoDB installed. Okay, okay. Also, we need to make sure that we are already running our MongoDB. So for that, if you was installing it with the brew, then the command to do this is brew services start MongoDB from Unity. So, yeah, I have it already started. So I'll restart it again to make sure that everything is fine. Okay, and if you have successfully started it, then you will see this lock in the console that it was successfully started. Did everyone saw this? Thing when trying to run you your MongoDB? Please raise your hand. This is really important. Yeah? Yeah, I think Assistant might help you if you install it via something else. Let's take a few minutes to make sure that everything has it and continue. That should be start, that shouldn't be restart.
Потому что я перезапускала. Нет, если у тебя не был запущен тебе. Should be this one. Yeah, don't be confused by my last comment. I already had it started, so I just restarted to make sure that everything is fine. You need to run the start MongoDB community comment. Should we still wait? There are more questions and more and more. <laughs> problems with Windows. Uh, no, we should go on. I'll try to provide a cloud MongoDB instance where they can all connect. connect. Yeah, um, and then we can, you know, because they they just need the connection string, and it's like ten or fifteen minutes okay. down the road, right? No, I think uh, so. That should be fine. Help no, people I'm to install MongoDB. 
<laughs> Someone's attacking me. Um, <laughs> all right, so what we're going to do for people who couldn't install on the VBS, I'm going to create a cloud server, and you're going to be able to connect to that. Uh, the reason for why we want you to install MongoDB obviously is first you need to learn how to do that, and it's great if you have a local MongoDB installation that you can work with. Um, but we're not going to take more time in the class because the first ten minutes or so will be will not be related to the work that we're going to do with MongoDB directly. So you don't need it just this second. And I'm going to provide you with what you need a connection screen for connecting to the database, so don't worry about it, um, and we can start the lecture. Okay, then let's continue. Uh, the topics of today's lecture. All right, was that clear? Folks, let's get together and uh, gather our intentions. There is nothing else to do right now. Um, if you don't get it working, that's fine. At the right point in time in the lecture, I'm going to share you what you need to know in order to Go on working, and you're not going to miss anything. So let's focus on the class. OK. Uh, even though the topic is MongoDB, I would like to begin from a general overview of what the database is and why do we need it in our project. And please raise your hand and tell me what do you think the database is or what it could be, in your opinion. Anyone? Yeah? Yeah, place for the storing data and retrieving it when, whenever we need that. Any other ideas? Okay, data with the tables that we can remove, delete. Yeah, that's somewhat correct. So the database actually is somewhat similar to what we did in our previous lectures with the file. So we used our file as a database. Uh, and we saved there those JSON formatted objects uh, and we was able to load them back, we was able to do something with the data from this file, to update, to create people or meetups, and then load it back to the file again. But this approach uh, is a bit not scalable uh, with this file database. You can't use it when you have a lot of users or when you have a lot of meetups, a lot of data. Um, because it will be really limited. So you will have to read the whole file first, load it to the memory, and do some operation on it. So for example, find people with the age more than 25 or so. And that's, again, not the best, and it's slow. Let's think of a real example. For example, our favorite Facebook. If it will store all the user it has in one file, together with the likes, posts, and comments that it had, and then, for example, we will ask it to show us the list of our friends. In this case, it will need, if you could use the file database, uh, it will need to load all this file into the memory and then search for those people who are still our friends there. And this will take a lot of time because Facebook has 2.4 billion users, so it will be a really huge operation. And it will be really strange because if we will update our browser again, this, the whole process of loading files into the memory will have to start over. So it will take a lot of time, it will be inefficient. And the real database software abstracts it all away from us. It helps us to do the same things, uh, but in a more convenient and a more performant and scalable way. With the database, uh, data can be easily accessed, easily managed, and we also can ask uh, databases for questions. And in the technical uh, wor uh, world, it's called query. So we can query our database for some records with the specific parameters. We can create new records. We can update them, save them, store them. And in this case, we won't need to worry about the file management or access management to this data. Um, because database software will handle it all for us and also abstracts the complexity of these things from us. So it will be easy to do. Uh, okay, now we had a short overview about databases, and let's move to the MongoDB. MongoDB is a popular nowadays uh, database software because of its ease of use and unique properties. It let us store uh, the whole uh, 
object in a JSON-like documents, and it's somewhat similar to what we was doing with the our file database. So we were storing the whole object. Uh, we will see also during this lecture how much code we will remove from the previous our um, approach that we did. And even though we will remove all that stuff, we will have still the same functionality, so we will be able to do all the same operations with this. Okay, uh, let's go quickly through the small changes that I had in the project. So it's basically uh, how it was at the end of the previous one, except that I introduced another folder here to make it more structured and clear. So I introduced the folder called Routes. And I moved, um, and if you will go to the person.js in the routes folder, you will see all the endpoints that we previously have in our index.js file. But since we have uh, several objects there, uh, it will be nice and more clear and understandable that we will separate them into different files. So I have uh, routes for the meetup, which are basically the same with the things that we did with the uh, person, so we can find all meetups, we can find it by ID, or create a new meetup, or also the person routes are also here. We actually did, had something similar, so we already did this with the models. We split model of the person from model of the meetup, so it's on a different file. And if you'll go to the index.js file, you will see that to make it work, to have these external routes files, I had to require them in the index.js so that app, uh, Express application will know that it should use uh, those routes when I'm asking for them. So here is a person route, and there is also meetup routes. The rest is basically what we had with the owner. We created last week a web server by using Express library, and uh, learned about different types of um, requests that we can have, like get, post, or delete. We also created a REST API that we just uh, saw, and now we have a lot of different endpoints that we can use. And we was able to use them from a web browser with the help of a library called Axios, and also send the, those requests to our application. Okay, that was a quick overview, and let's move back to what we can have. So if we'll go to the base service, we will see that we have a common function like find all or add item, and they are unified to be able to, so we could use them together with the, for a person service or for meetup service, it doesn't matter, so they unify. We can add person or meetup or we can create another person, that's fine. Also delete and find by ID. But let's think of a scenario if we want to get person, uh, all the people that we have in our database who are older than 25, for example. How would I do that? Can anyone help me with this? Any ideas? Um, I want to find someone uh, with the age that is, old, uh, that is greater than 25. How would I do this? Yeah? Look through. Um, we already have find all, and it might wor work too. Yeah, but it will be probably to take longer. Um, can what? Filter. Yeah, that's an op also an option. Yeah. Inside here. Here. Um, I actually like might you. do the another thing. I like, think she meant here. P ah, here. Mm -hmm. PID. Yeah, that's true. So it should be PH then, and it should be greater than twenty-five. Will that work? Should uh, what? Then uh, or array. <laughs> 
That's also yeah, another question. Can you repeat the answer? Yeah, the answer was that it will give us only one person. And that's actually the problem here. That's right. Another problem here is that uh, we will find only people with age 25. But if what will happen if we want another age here? In this case, we can also pass the age here and compare this here. But again, the problem is that we will have only one person in this case. And it will be also slow because, again, we will have to load the whole database that we have into the uh, memory and then search for it. Um, and if you will think about it, so if we will have a lot of users asking for that question at the same time, and we will have a lot of data, it will be really hard to process with the file database system. For that purpose, we use database software and we delegate this responsibility to it. Um, uh, because this approach will save us from a lot of trouble. And when we use the database software, those operations happen actually almost instantly, so we don't even notice that. And it doesn't matter if it will be one user or it will be a million users at the same time, because software, database software can handle it. Um, let's introduce the MongoDB Tower project. I will turn back. We don't actually need that for now. Um, MongoDB is a software, as I already told, and it can run on our laptops, on a local host, or it can be running anywhere. So Arman is somewhere yeah. proving that it's possible, so you will be able to connect to some I server <laughs> outside, <laughs> somewhere outside of your laptop. And it's pretty much like we did with the HTTP server, uh, which also means that we need to have a way to communicate to this MongoDB because it's a separated thing. And there are open source libraries that was written by nice people in the internet uh, for every language that you might think of. And there is also one for Node.js. It helps us to interact with the MongoDB and also helps to send some commands to it. And this library is called Mongoose. Yeah, it designs the way that it has a lot of commands that we can use. And it's a really popular library to use. So I'm still surprised why not included in the Node.js, because uh, it's the common setup that you can use. Um, how could I install the external library to my project? Who can? Yeah. NPM install Mongoose. Let's create it, add it to our project. And who can tell me what should I see as a change when I install the external library in my project? Oh, yeah. Make sure that we are also in a fig file folder. Otherwise, it won't work. Yeah, that's right. We will see the difference in our package JSON. We will see that the Mongoose was added here with the version that we're going to use. And also there was changes in the node modules and all the dependencies of the Mongoose was added there. That's right. OK, let's create a new file in our project in the big file folder. Um, and oh, that's not modules. Inside the big file folder and call it mongo connection.js. We installed Mongoose to our project and now I want to use it in this file. How I'm going to do this? Please yes. Raise your hand, please, yeah. Please raise and tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we need to require it in our first line. So we can create const mongoose equal require mongoose. <coughs> and since the database is a completely different application, so it's not anyhow related to our Node.js, 
We need to make, make a connection between those things. And until this connection will be open, nothing will happen. And once we connect to the database, this connection will stay there, and rather until we will disconnect our app or until we will kill the app or kill the connection. That's also possible. And who can guess how the function might call might be called for installing uh, set up the connection between our project and Mongoose? Connect. Yeah, that's right. There is a lot of voices telling that it might be connect. You also can see it here on the screen that it's in a hint, like very popular one. And this function expecting from us the address of our database. It's pretty much the same like we had with the web page that we uh, when we are opening the browser. And this address should told where our database is located. And in our case, since it's a MongoDB connection, it will be not HTTP, but it will be MongoDB dash dash localhost. And as the last part of this location or address, we need to pass the name of the database. Um, and it can be anything. It's usually test, but we will call it WTM. And in this case, it will create a new database inside our local database with this name. So we will be able to use it. And it's also helpful to create something with not default name because there might be different applications that you can use and to separate them from each other it's better to have a separate one. Okay. Um, we might also need to check that we got connected to the mongoose and for that let's uh, wrap it with the main function. Uh, since the mongoose.connect returns, returns a promise, we need to wait for that until this connection will be established. And unfortunately, the, currently the top level I think is not supported yet with the, those versions that we use. But we can do this thing, so follow me. We can have a main function here that will be asynchronous. And we will put the, our connection in there. And after that, we will have a console log that will tell us that it's connected. And then we will execute our function. That should be. Okay. We introduced some new code for our project. But our application doesn't know about it. So it have no idea that we created a file or we added some code here. And to make our application know about it, we should go to the index.js and require it here. So please go to the uh, index.js file and let's require our file. Since we don't have anything exported from that file, we just need to import this code and just have it executed, we can just require it directly without assigning it to the variable. Monco connection. Um, is everyone is following me up until that point? Oh yeah. So we created a new file and in this file, we want to establish a connection with the MongoDB. So we send it, um, asked Mongoose to establish a connection and said that we will use it at this address so it can ask to create a new database in that address if it's there. And if it will be successful, we should see the board connected in our console. We also require this file in our index.js application. So it should know that we have this code in our project. Let's try to run it and see what will happen. OK, it 
it's crushed. And that's because I didn't made an NPM install. Since we used some plugin, if you remember, in the third lecture, flatted, instead of just JSON uh, stringify, we used this library called, called flatted. So let's try to run the application again. That's true. I'm missing the error function here, actually. Or function. Oh, thanks for the catch. And now you can see that server is listening and that the connection is established, which is great. But we also see some warnings here. If you will check and read what it says, it asks us to pass those objects. It's probably because there was some updates with the version, and to make it backwards compatible, we need to pass those things. So it won't affect us, but let's just get rid of them so they won't annoy us in the future. Uh, we will need to add it as an object, as a second parameter here. So we will pass the use unified topology equal to true. And another warning asks for use new URL parser also set to true. And then if we will save our file and the nodemon will restart our application, we don't see those warnings anymore. So we established the connection. Is everything fine? You're following me? Is there anyone who cannot see the connect of that? You look, you can copy. Uh, obviously. There are people okay. who don't see okay. it. Obviously, some of you don't have MongoDB installed. Yeah, right? Um, Still, it doesn't have MongoDB installed. Yeah, I mean, of course, right? But Windows. And we're trying to get a cloud server set up for you. Apparently, it's taking a little bit more time than expected. Um, and I will provide you with a connection string, hopefully in a couple of minutes. If that's not possible, um, we're just going to move on for now. And I'm going to share you my own IP address and use my laptop for you to connect to. Um, but for now, we can just go on as, as we would. OK. Um. Now we have Mongoose in our project, and we have it connected to the MongoDB database that we are also running on our laptops. Let's talk about how Mongoose actually works. It basically replaces the models that we have. So if we'll go to the folder models and see the person model, for example, the Mongoose replaces it with the thing that it understands and can um, send it further to the MongoDB. So it won't understand our fi file database approach, and we need to <laughs> and we need to uh, do something else with it. But also, Mongoose uh, models are very power powerful, powerful things, and they provide a lot of different methods for us. So it gives us a lot of power and make it all the uh, operations faster and. Also, it's much stronger than just the file database approach. To make it all work, we need to change this file. So let's comment out the code that we had, because we can't use it anyway. And at the end, when we will change it, we will see how much code we removed compared to what we had. Again, since we need to use the mongoose in this file, we need to require it. So we'll type const mongoose require mongoose. And there is a thing in mongoose that's actually somewhat similar to the constructor that we have here. And it also gives us a structure for the uh, Ob future object that we want to see in our database. And this uh, thing called schema, and we need to have it for our person to 
say to MongoDB that we want to have a person with those fields. Um, for that, we need to type const and create a var variable for our schema, person schema. And that will be equal to mongoose.schema. And it takes the parameter, an object here. And in this object, we need to define our fields. Um, we already had like age and name, so let's create them. But we need to also specify the types for those fields. So we can't do it the same way like we did here and expect that everything will work. Um, can someone tell me what kind of data types do we know in JavaScript? Yeah? String, number, yeah, that's correct. That's actually what we will need for those fields for now. Um, so I need the name field and the type for it. What type I will need for that? String, yeah. Hmm? And we also need an age field. And what type would I use for the age? Yeah, there is no integer or floating points numbers in JavaScript. We have only number. So we will use number for that. And that's basically the schema that we need. Oh, thank you. Good cage. Um, that's the schema. It's not a model yet, but we will get there. So the model needs from us uh, a name and the schema. So we won't construct this uh, model here. Actually, Mongoose uh, models are very powerful and they give a lot of uh, functionality out of the box for us. So once we will create it and it will be functioning, function, then it will be really cool. Let's create our model. So for that we will create another variable called person model and we will use the mongoose method called model and this method expects us to pass the name of the uh, scheme uh, name of the model that we want to call it so it will be person in our case it's Mongoose.model. Mongoose.model, that's the method of the Mongoose library. And also we need to pass the schema here. So how would I do this? What should I type here? We already have it created here, so... Person schema, yeah. Okay. And again, as we did with the person class before, so our code will know that we have this uh, person model and we can use it in other places in our code. We need to export this schema. So we will type module.exports and we will export our person model. And that's basically it. This is our model that we can use and with those few lines, you basically have a lot of functionality out of the box. Um, and now we also can communicate from our application to the Mongoose, and it will understand what we are asking it for. Yeah? Uh, that's actually a good catch that we don't... Yeah, uh, I was asked why we don't include ID here, since we have it already. Meetups, we will get there, we don't need them for now, but uh, for the ID, uh, we also don't need to include it here because MongoDB will create uh, its own unique ID for the each uh, record that it will create in the database. And we will see later that it will look a bit different, but it will be there. Um,
OK. We also need to make a use out of those new person model. And those code we can remove. There is a lot of things. We don't need them anymore. This is will replace it. Um, let's go to the person service. We will see that we already have a person model here. It was a, with the previous approach, but we already required it in our file, so we don't need it again. And we're also sending this person model further to the base service because we're using base service for both meetups and person. And if we will go to the base service, on the top of the file in the constructor, we see that we're also passing this model here. So basically, if we will update those functions right now, we will be able to use them both for a person or for a meetup. So we, will, we won't specify for which model exactly we will use them. Um, let's try to replace our find all function. Um, as I already said, Mongoose has a lot of different methods in, in, the, in their box that it provides for us. And if you want to know more about the method that it has, since it's an open source library, there is a huge documentation that explains all the methods it has and how to use them and also with examples. So we can go to the, the documentation there. But for now, uh, let's trust me, <laughs> since I know already some of those methods that we're going to use, and just follow me. So let's comment out this code. It won't work anyhow for us, because it again uses the our file database approach. But we will see that instead of this one, we will need to return, um, since it will work for both models, we will use the this model. And we will use a mongoose method called find. And this method, uh, if you don't pass any parameters to that, it will go to the database and return all the record that it has with this model. So in our case, person model, for example. Um, so you see that we changed actually a lot of code. So it was around 10 lines. And now it's only one. But it's the same functionality. So it's a magic. It's really magic because we don't need to write all of this. It's already handled by us by the smart software databases. Um, and that's actually it. So we can try and go like we was able to see the list of people in the browser when we was making it last time. Let's go to the browser and check if we will still be able to do that. So let's open the browser and go to the local host person.all and I see that the number of the items is zero. Who can tell me why we have zero? We added some people before in our previous lecture, but I don't see anyone here. Yeah, actually all answers I hear from here are correct. So they were saved in the JSON file, so it wasn't our database yet. And now, since we are introduced our database software, it's saved in another place, and we're asking this place, but it doesn't have any entries now. But we actually didn't update the methods that we have there to create people. So we can't use our actions requests to uh, make the people. So let's go back to the base service and see what we can do with the add function. Again, it has a lot of code here. And we can comment or directly actually remove it, since you already saw this magic with the lines of code that we removed. And we will use another method of the mongoose that it provides for the model. And this will be this model.create. And we want to create the 
person or meetup, and so we will have to pass the item here. And again, you see that that's all that we need to write here, instead of all those lines that we had before. And let's check if this is going to work. Let's go to the browser and create someone. For example, we can create nerd. <laughs> we will need to write a post request with the library called Exos to the dash person and then pass the object with the person. So if we will see, and then we will update the browser page. We will see that Nerd is here. <laughs> and yeah, we can create a few more. For example, I can create myself but with the correct page, for example. And if I will add me, then hopefully I will be here too. Yeah, I'm also here. And uh, back to the question about the ID. So you can see this underscore ID field, and you see that it's not like one, two, three, four that we used to have before. It's again because it's generated by the MongoDB, and it will be always unique, and it will be always pointing to the, this specific object in a database. So we can use it as it is, but no worries that it will be duplicated. And there is another weird field, which is underscore underscore V, which is uh, somewhat related to the version control, but we can skip it for now because it's also generated by the Mongo automatically and yeah, we don't have a use for it right now. And I'm going to continue with where Maria left off. But where's Maria? Is she around? Um, I noticed that we didn't really support her during her first lecture. Could you give her another round of applause? That was a huge achievement, if you didn't notice, because she was extremely professional. Um, I'm totally amazed by her performance. That was a very, very hard thing to pull off, to, to, to talk about MongoDB um, and kick off the, the lecture. So, you know, next year it's going to be your turn, hopefully, and we're going to see you among us. Um, let me continue. So we were. What did we do last time? Could you remind me? I was busy with installing MongoDB, so I need to refresh my memory. Could you help me? What did we do in the first hour? Raise your hand and, and tell me something. Please. We created files. Which files? We created a kind of a file for a database, like the schema, you mean, the person model, or the connection one? The, the person model, yeah. Perfect. Let's look at that. So it's under models, person.js, right? We did this one. Um, then we created a MongoDB connection file, right? And then we changed something on our base service. Can anybody tell me what we did? with the base service. Please raise your hands. Don't be shy. Come on. You're like 55 people. 2% of the population should be able to speak up. Please. We changed two methods in the base service. Find all and add. OK. Why did we do it? Wait, someone else. Why did we do it? Why did we change these two methods, find all and add? Anybody? Please. Because now we can use the MongoDB methods that are already there, that are already provided to us. So previously, we wrote the base service um, because we didn't have anything else. All of it were our code. But obviously, we use the power of open source. And we are using libraries that other people develop for us. Hopefully, in your jobs, you will never have to write a base service again. But I wanted you to feel what it feels like to have everything done by yourself, to create a file, to read records. That was a lot of hassle, right? You had to go through it in order to appreciate what actual real databases and their libraries do for us. 
And since we're now using MongoDB and Mongoose, which is a spe specific library for MongoDB, we get a lot of functionality for free. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue doing the same thing and really thin this file further. So I'm going to do the same thing for deletion. Right now, as you all know, we are using file deletion or deletion based on, on the file. I'm going to replace it. Find all and add are here. I'm going to write, I'm going to pretty much follow the same structure. I'm going to say return this.model. What? Delete. Perfect. And delete, when you call it, it says it wants a request. So that's basically a query object. So whatever you pass into it, it will try to find those items and delete them. In this case, we want to delete items with a specific ID, right? That's why I'm querying it by ID. Okay, I'm using node one at the bottom, so that should be fine. Let's go here and see. We had two people in the database. Let's see, I want to delete Arman. That should be axios.delete, right? I bet you already have it in your cache somehow. OK, it didn't work. This model delete is not a function. Why is that? We use Dell. Let's try that. Still didn't work. This model that Dell is not a function. Uh, we use Dell in Axios. No, it's fine. Delete also works. Um, I th I believe this is called remove. And you see when I refresh it, Arman is deleted. So the situation here is naming is hard, right? People use different names. For what we use, Dell or delete. Mongoose and MongoDB prefer to use remove. Um, you're going to see this all the time. There is no consistency in the choice of words. So we're going to run into this issue more and more in the future. And um, in order to make sure you're doing the right thing, you have to have the documentation open somewhere and be checking through it. Mongoose has a very extensive documentation. Delete? Delete one. Yeah. So here in the in the model, there are tons of different methods. Find by ID and remove. Find by ID and delete. Model remove is what we used. Replace one. There are tons and tons of different um, methods that you can use. I don't know all of them. I don't know most of them. I just know a couple. Whenever I need something, I go to the documentation and read through and find out what I want. Usually, uh, just a command F search will get you what you want. So make sure you have this documentation open somewhere while you're developing. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of frustration. It's mongoosejs.com slash docs slash API or whatever. All right. Let's do the same thing for find. Now. This is another discrepancy. Let's go to find all. If you notice, when we wanted to use find all, what we did was we used this model.find. So when Mongoose has just one find function that accepts an object for a query, if you don't have a query, you don't have to pass in any objects. If you don't pass in any objects, it fetches all the records. So it does a find all operation. Again, a discrepancy. And what we called find in our base service is something else in MongoDB and Mongoose, of course. And that is 
called find by ID. All right? And you're going to pass in item ID. We can delete these two lines. So you see, what we call find MongoDB calls something else. What we call find all MongoDB or Mongoose um, calls something else, which is very confusing, but it's totally fine. This is what you're going to see every single time you're dealing with software and other people's code. There's no consistency in naming. Um, question. In the delete method, yeah. Yes, there's an underscore before the ID in the property name. Why is that? It's because it's a special property added by Mongo. And they want to make sure that it doesn't overlap with what you might have. You might have your own ID field. Actually, that was what I was doing in the, in the first lecture. If you watch the video from the first, you know, from two years ago, the same lecture, I was using a special plugin that would add an ID field. I'm not going to do that um, today because it's not really necessary. We have those IDs already. Um, so underscore ID is unique. It's added by MongoDB, and they don't want it to overwrite your own ID. And a good way to do it is to put garbage letters before them. So underscore, underscore, dollar, dollar, something like that. No problem. All right. Um, there is a default value here. I don't need it. Our IDs now look totally different. It's not going to work even if I write equals one. So I'm going to remove it as well. Let's see if the first find will work. So this is the, like, everybody, let's get Matt's ID and do slash person slash Matt's ID. And it works. We can find that. If you don't believe me, let's write something else. And it won't work. It will actually crash. Because it expects a special format, and when you don't provide it, it's just going to crash. OK. So save all. Previously, we used save all for pretty much any other method that we developed, right? We used it when we wanted to delete an object. We used it when we wanted to add a new object. We first fetched all the objects in the database, in our file database added an item to that array, and then used save all, right? Do we need it right now? I did a search in my code base. I don't have anything else that references save all. So actually, I'm going to remove that, that method. That was an internal method. That wasn't something um, that was used from outside. So I can actually remove it. And this is what I'm going to end up with. It actually fits in my screen. It's like 21 lines with all the spaces. So what we're doing is we're passing on the requests to MongoDB and Mongoose. Now, this isn't very useful, this class. If you look at it, it doesn't do anything special. Wherever you are calling add, you could just say model.create. Wherever you are calling Dell, you could just say model that remove, right? There would be nothing to stop you from doing it. Um, let me show you here. Person router is where we use these things. I could just import person model here and just do, do these operations. But um, I'm, which means you know I could delete this file. I, I wouldn't need a, a person service. I wouldn't need a base service. I could just use MongoDB or Mongoose models. Can anybody tell me, make a guess for why that would be problematic, why I wouldn't want to do that? Delete these files and use Mongoose model directly. Why, what could be the reason that I have the concept of a service? We talked about this on week three. Why would I want to have a service? and a base service. Anybody? Don't be shy. Because it takes longer to use the actual MongoDB model. Why would it take longer?
Okay. Um, there was a performance concern. If everybody asks the same question to the same server, it might go down. We don't have a performance concern here. The performance is the same. The base service and all the services that we develop already use Mongoose underneath. So there is no performance issue there. There is something else. Anybody who would remember week three? Come on. Please. Does it have to do with the fact that it is asynchronous operations? No. Anyone else? Modules. Perfect. Yeah, this is actually what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm trying to modularize my code, which means um, I should be able to plug and play different modules, and they should still work. Now, if you look at this thing, remember, usually each file are written by multiple people or multiple um, people in a single team. So a team would be responsible for maintaining this file, this layer of talking to the URLs. Another team would be responsible for this service or any other file that you have. And the, the model is also one of those, right? The, the model here. Another team would maintain this file. Now, what we don't want is dependency. We don't want to depend on other people's choices. We don't want to depend on past choices made by other people that are not in the organization anymore. We just want to do our work and take in whatever little surface they expose to us. Which means, for this code, do I have to know which database am I using right now? Is there any specific reference to MongoDB here? No, right? That is actually exactly what I want to keep, that flexibility. Which means in the future, I can replace this database. In the future, maybe MongoDB will go out of business. Maybe it won't be supported anymore. And I will have to rewrite my code for another database. Would I really want to burden this team with that detail? No, because for them, it shouldn't matter at all. So we want to push things away from us as much as possible, push responsibilities away from us as much as possible. The responsibility of this file is to get the requests from the URLs and to push them away to somewhere else, to some other team. Okay. The responsibility of this file is to define what an entity, like a person, what an object is in a database and what an object can do in a database. All right. That's all. It doesn't care about URLs. Is there any reference to a URL here? Does it even know that it lives in a web application? This could be any application. This could be a desktop application as well. It doesn't know if it's a web application or not. So the responsibility of this thing is to ensure that there is a MongoDB connection. This is specifically for MongoDB. This also doesn't work with PostgreSQL or any other database, which means you can actually replace this part with another database, keep this, and still do your job if you ensure there is a link in between. And what is that link? What? Base service. Yes, exactly. That link is the base service. This thing, this layer that goes between the database and the, the routers, the service layer is the link that defines how we should interact with the database. So if we need to change a database in the future, all we need to do is to replace the models. Obviously, we're going to have new models, although there are some libraries that have generic models, generic functionality, enough that you can switch the database technology and nothing would change in your application. In this case, we would need to change the person model because Mongoose only works with Mongo. And the base service, just these calls here. Maybe the new database would call this search. That would be the only change to make this work. It's a very little change, and we're changing the entire database. And the layers about this, the controller, um, what we call a controller, the, the routes here, they are not involved at all. We don't need to change this file here to make that 
uh, to, to change the database. Am I clear? This is why we need a service layer in between. You don't need it for your average developer. You don't need it for your pet project. You need it if you work in a bigger team. And that is our goal, right? This class is designed to make you a world-class full-stack JavaScript developer. That's why we're trying to teach you the best, best practices. And a lot of the code that you find online will basically skip the service layer and just call the, um, you know, for, for get all, what they're going to do is they're going to do meetup model and find. And when they have more complex queries, they're going to put their query conditions here. Give me people great, uh, with ages greater than 25. Now, this is a business requirement. What if you want to change it to 26? It's a business logic. It's, it has nothing to do with your URLs. It is your query capabilities that shouldn't be in this. So it wouldn't be scalable, obviously, in a real application. And in your applications as well, which are getting real and real every week, you're going to have hundreds of lines of code here that will be horrible to maintain. We need to split them up into chunks that make sense. That's what we mean by the word modularization. You can find millions of articles online uh, on how to do this. But the best way to do it is to introduce a layer of services that will bridge the outer world, the URLs, and the database. OK? Do I make sense? Do I make sense? Raise your hands if I don't make sense, because some people don't say anything. One. No, raise your hands if I don't make sense. And it's totally fine. All right. Then I'm going to move on. Do we have anything else in the base service? No. Oh, by the way, I'm going to hopefully implement a very interesting feature, which will underline the usefulness of services. Um, the, the split between a base service and a person service. Because if you go to a person service right now, all you see is it's extending from the base service and passing on some information, right? It, it actually is completely useless, but we're going to make it useful. Um, while we're here, let's change this a little bit. Right now, we don't need this path, person database at JSON, so I'm going to remove that. That was for when I was saving to a local database, local file. So I'm going to remove that. Okay. If you're running Node.js 12, there is a new feature in, uh, supported in Node.js for making this even simpler. And I'm going to be using that. First, let me remove the database path from the uh, base service as well. And that is by adding model equals person model here and removing the constructor. So these two lines, line five here, model equals person model, and line six here, line five, six, seven here are the same. This is a way to declare a property in Node.js. Um, in JavaScript, it's not standardized yet. Node.js supports it. Some libraries support it. You just say model equals person model, and it translates to having um, having this constructor. This model equals person model. So these these lines are exactly the same. The lines here are the same. So we're just going to simplify it, and we don't need to use it here anymore. So it's going to be even simpler. All right, it's like magic. We're <laughs> we're deleting. Um, most of the code that we have written so far for salvation. Let's go to meetup service and do the same thing. Just going to say model equals meetup model. Okay. Ooh, unexpected token. See, I'm using Node.js version 8. That's why it's not going to work. If your application crashed, it's not going to work for you. Question? We don't need to declare it um, because it will be declared on the instance itself. So it's equal to this.model 
first-person model. So there's no let or wire or const before this. Um, if you remember what I wrote here, these two are equivalent, these four lines. So this one line here is actually converted into these three lines. Um, it's just magic. I don't like it, but you're going to see this a lot in the future. That's why I have to teach it to you. Anyway, if you're using an old version of Node, it won't work. You have to use uh, version 12. And when you do that, it's going to work. You don't have to do it. It's fine. I uh, just wanted to let you know in case you want to simplify it further. Are you following me so far? Are you with me? OK, cool. Now let's do something else. We verified the delete. We verified the find, right? They all work. Now, um, what did we do as an example before? Oh, wait, there's the, the meetup service, the, the meetup model. Let me quickly do that as well. Follow me. Um, as any decent developer, I'm going to go to person model, copy it, the entire code, put it in meetup model, right? And then modify it to match my needs. This is literally what every single developer on Earth does. They don't write stuff from scratch. They copy paste. I um, take all the person words and replace them with meetup. You can do this easily in your IDE. I'm not going to tell you how. I want you to research it. You can choose multiple um, words at the same time and then replace them. So a meetup would have a name. What else would it have? What property would a meetup have? Location. Perfect. Attendees. Who said attendees? Great. We're going to come to that. That is the exciting bit. Um, a meetup has a name and a location, right? And this is pretty much OK. I can remove the old code. So it was as easy as this. I also removed chalk. We don't need chalk anymore. Um, OK, do what I did. Copy paste person model, replace uh, wherever you see person with meetup, and change age to location with a string. Obviously, it should be a string. Now, let's see if this works. Meetup all. The number of items is zero. Let's try to create a new meetup. Meetup name women take makers Berlin. And location is no. <laughs> location is 35. <laughs> OK, you, we have to live with it. The location is 35. Wait, can I delete it? Will it work if I delete it? It worked. Isn't it beautiful? Why did it work? Anybody? I didn't change meetup service, right? I didn't change meetup routes, anything. I just changed the model. Does it ring a bell? This is what I talked like 10 minutes before. I changed from one database technology to another one. I changed from a file to MongoDB, right? And I didn't have to change anything else in my application. It just worked. This is why we have services in between as an abstraction. This is why we have a base service as an abstraction. right? We don't need to do anything else. We were able to delete that, um, that record. Do I make sense? You are very impressed. <laughs> no? You didn't like it? <laughs> that was very polite. Thank you. <laughs> I said, you're very interested. And she said, no. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not impressed. I do this every day. I eat this for breakfast. Um, but jokes aside, this is a really groundbreaking um, software architecture. 
So, which means I can actually create any one with a proper location. I hope I'll get it right this time. Let's call it Wayfair. Let's refresh it. It works. Wayfair. Perfect. Right? Now, what else do we have? Any questions so far? OK, maybe you're not impressed as well. It became a little bit heavy. Can I explain anything better? I mean, I, I can try at least. Yeah, you need to review the video to make sure it, it settles in. All right. Um, then let me do something. Um, did you notice when I did 35 as the location? Is that a valid location? Not really. It's not even postcode, right? That doesn't work. Um, can I abuse the data here? Let's say, can I create a person without a name? Let's go to person all. We have Matt right now. Let me try to create a person um, without a name. They will just have an age. You know what? Let's not even have age. I refresh the, the page and I see that I was able to create a person without a name and an age. Does it work? It messes up with my data. I mean, it worked. I was able to create that resource. But I don't want that, right? Um, there is a concept called validation in databases and pretty much in any software that you're going to see because we don't want people to mess with our structures. We want very rigid structures. In order to create a person, you have to give them a name at least. Why at least? Do you have to give them an age? Or is it possible to create a person without an age? Think of it in real life. Depends on what kind of users you want to use with the age. I'm asking for the age. Is it possible to create a, a real person um, without an age? No. Yes, why? <laughs> All platforms don't know our ages. That's correct. You know, you don't have to give them your ages. But I was talking about real, real life. So every baby that is born, unless I'm mistaken, is under one year old of age, right? They are literally born with zero years of age. They might not know their age if they don't know their birth certificate. That's for sure. <laughs> but, but the... <laughs> yeah, they have an age. So my idea is you don't really... If you want to create a new baby, you don't have to enter an age yourself. You just give it a name, and you should have a new baby um, with age zero, right? So we have different types of validations. One is we can dictate what we want, what, what is required. And that is we can say, you have to have a name. Another one, we can say, you have to make sure the name is more than three characters. because we're French, and we don't pronounce half of the characters that we write anyway. So, <laughs> um, and another type of validation we can say, if you don't have any ages, then we're going to set it to zero, to a default value, so that you don't have to deal with it. We did the same thing with our functions. If you remember the item ID equals one, we had a default for, for an ID. So that's what I'm going to implement here. I'm going to go to the person service, right? And I'm going to add some validation here. And it's super, super, super simple in Mongoose. This is why we're using MongoDB and, and Mongoose, because it's you know very, very straightforward. Instead of saying name 
is string, I will say name is an object. I'm now configuring the field name. I say the type for the name is a string. Okay? And it's also required. You have to add a name. And let's say min length, and it autocompletes whenever I'm typing. Min length is, I don't know, three. So you can't, it, does anybody have a name with two characters, two letters? No? Okay. Two letters? Your what? Your dog? Your daughter. Perfect. Sorry. Uh, it's a little bit hard. Question? Your family name is two letters, so let's make it two. I hope there are nobody with a single letter name. Um, all right, name type string is required. Mean length is two. Let's let's see if this is working. Still, it is. Let's go back to the to the browser and try to create the same person. I get an error in the console. It says validation error. Person validation failed. Name path name is required, which means I have to pass in a name. So whenever you're getting an error, first always look at the first line. You you are always concentrating on the last lines that don't tell you anything. Always look at the first line. That is actually what the error is. And the next line is where the error happened. Um, so make sure you, you look into those two lines. And it says path name is required. So let's add a name. Name. Jason. Let's create it. And I didn't get any errors. Let's refresh it. Jason is there. Let's try to create a person with just one letter, T. It crashed again. And this time, the error that I get, path name T is shorter than the minimum allowed length 2. So I added very simple validation to my models. OK? All the code that I had to write is, is these three lines. Instead of string, I said it's an object. The type is string. It's required. Minimum length is 2. You can have maximum length. You can have all kinds of different validations. You can have custom validations. You can have asynchronous validations to ask another service if this is a legit postcode, for example. Um, you can do everything you want with validations. Um, and that will be, obviously, your research if you want to do that. Let's do the same thing for age. I said its type is number. And if you don't pass in any age, the default should be zero, right? Now, if you look at it, Jason doesn't have an age. I didn't pass in an age. Now, let's say this is Mr. T instead of T. And let's create this person and refresh. You're going to see Mr. T has an age of zero. Now, whatever default you want, you can put in there. You can say it's 18. Ah, perfect. This is a great use case. You have to be, we, we are dealing with Bitcoin. In order to register, you have to be over 18. So we're going to say there's, there isn't going to be any defaults. It's going to be required, right? And it will be minimum 18. I save this. Let's create a new person, Mr. Z. It's going to crash. The error is path age is required. I have to add in age. Let's add age 16. Oh, I don't want to save it. I want to run it. And it's going to say age 16 is less than minimum allowed value 18. So I just added a very easy validation for my object. OK? And obviously, when you refresh it, you won't see it there. However, when I make sure Mr. Z is a young person over 18, or at least 18, we can create that record. All right? 
This is extremely useful. This is going to be one of your homeworks to add validation to at least one of your models. So find a condition that your models, your objects, must satisfy and add it. All right. We're making great progress. Now, I have the person model, I have the meetup model. Remember, again, I didn't change anything else. I didn't change meetup service other than the syntax change, the change from constructor to this. I didn't change meetup router here. It's still the same, and it all works. What is missing? What is missing? What did I leave out? What, what didn't I tell you yet? There's something missing. This, this can't be the end of the lecture, right? How to make someone attend the meetup? Yes, perfect. This is what I'm going to talk about next. And again, this is going to be your homework, so please follow closely. Um, in the previous weeks, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about the, the homework or to show you what the homework requires. This week, we have about like 50 minutes or an hour. So I'm going to make sure that you all um, get it clearly. And um, we're going to be, as a homework, we're going to be changing all the relations between your objects into URLs and into relations in MongoDB. So it's going to be a lot of work. You're going to do a little bit more than what you had to do in the previous weeks. However, that is why next week we are moving with testing. And on week seven, we have uh, the front end. And on week eight, we have the deployment. So this is the last week that we're going to add something to your backend application in the course. The remaining weeks are testing, front end, and deployment, which means you will have three weeks to finalize the replication. So I'm giving you a heads up. All right. We're almost, almost done. Testing and front end obviously will be in your homeworks and in your projects as well. We expect you to do testing and, and add a little bit of a front end at least. However, as far as the back end is concerned, these are like the database and the relations in the database are the last things that we're going to teach you. Literally, 95% of the applications on the web is just this. URLs, route handlers, passing them onto services, or maybe not even services, passing them onto databases. So you will have enough time to rewrite all of your business logic um, in MongoDB and through URLs, much like how I'm going to show you now. OK? Any questions? Is it scary? <laughs> OK, that's why we're going to have three weeks. Um, that's why we didn't do testing and front end before. We could just do front end last week or the week before. We wanted to make sure for the back end, where most of the business logic resides for this course, you will have enough time. And please don't leave your homeworks to the last minute, to the last day, or you're not going to receive any feedback at all. Um, that's why you have three weeks. Work on your homeworks, ask questions. Once you identify how to do it, it's going to be super, super quick. You're going to do it like a breeze, rewriting your objects and their relationships with URLs and MongoDB. It's going to be super quick. You just need to do it a couple of times, and then it's going to be super straightforward. Let me show it to you. Uh, if you followed the course so far, you know that we have meetups and people, as an example. people can attend meetups. Meet up, meetups have attendees, right? If you really close, um, follow the lectures closely, you're also going to know that we are first writing the usage of the code that doesn't exist. We're first visualizing how it should look like, and then we go in and implement it. We don't start with implementation from zero. We first write, OK, if you remember the, the first lecture, we said Arman should 
probably attend WTMB, right? And then we implemented the attend method. That's what we're going to do right now. So what is the interface here? The interface is the URL. I want to make sure this is the post request. I wasn't talking to you, my watch. Um, I'm going to make it a post request. So person with an ID, for example, Matt, should be able to attend a meetup. Person ID, OK? Probably, so what, what, what did we do in the, in the first class when you wanted to attend to a meetup? We said this that meetups push meetup, right? If you remember the code, um, the the code was here. Yeah, this dot meetup equals meetup, or a little bit further in here. Okay, this is still the same. Come on. in person. OK, yeah. What we had on week three was this dot meetups dot push meetup, right? So we have a property called meetups in, in the user. So we're going to use that in the URL as well. A user should have meetups, a list of meetups. And we want to add to this list of meetups, right? This is what it is. This is how you represent it in the URL. We have a person, and we want that person to attend to a new meetup. Is how we represent it by axios.post, which means this should be a post request. Okay. It should be slash person slash ID of that person, in this case, Mart. Slash meetups is Mart's um, list of meetups. And obviously, this won't take a, a name and an age anymore. It's going to take meetup. And it's going to take another ID. So let me go to um, all of my meetups and, and copy the ID of the first meetup. Yeah. So what I'm doing here is, or what I want to do here, is I want to add this meetup that I created with the ID something to the list of meetups for Mart, OK? And this should work. I'm going to run it. It doesn't work. It says 404. What is 404? Tell me more. Louder. Not found. Yeah, because we don't have that functionality yet. Now I'm satisfied with how it looks. I want this to look this way. And now I'm going to implement it. Not here, but here. So in person router, it was a new post request. I'm going to add it to the end of the, the list, router.post. The first one is the ID of the person slash meetups, right? That was the URL that I want to create. This is a request handler, so async request response. And let's say rest and um, pretend that I did it. And let's run this again. OK, well, we have the data. It says pretend that I did it. So it, the URL works. I was able to implement the URL, router.post ID meetups. ID is the ID of the person. Slash meetups is or should be about the list of meetups that person has. OK? Now, what, I'm gonna, what am I going to do here? I just have the ID of the person. I first need to find that person. Exactly what we did in our lectures before, right? Obviously, I'm not going to type it. I'm going to copy and paste it from the get handler. Const user equals await person service dot find rec params id. 
let's send the user back so that we know that it works. I have this. Let me go back quickly to run this again. And you see I get the user back. So it worked. So I have the user. Now, what should I do here? It's not a trick question. It is literally something that we're writing like 10 times every lecture. I have a user. What am I going to do here? What? We need a meetup ID. Perfect. What am I going to do else? We need a meetup ID. Well, wait, the question, let me rephrase the question. What are we trying to do generally with this handler? We try to add a meetup to the user. We try to make the user attend a meetup, right? Is that clear? What is the next step? I have a user. What am I going to do next? Where is the meetup? We don't have it yet. So I'm going to have the meetup. Let's fetch the meetup. Const meetup equals await meetup service. Oops, I don't have meetup service. Let me call meetup service. I'm going to copy and paste this line. OK, const meetup service equals require dot dot slash services slash meetup service. And now I have meetup service here. And then I can say find break body meetup. Is that right? That will, yeah, that is what it was. So let's return the, the meetup and see that it actually works. Yeah, looks like it's working. So what I did, I got the user. I got the meetup. So I now have a meetup and a user. This is pretty much the same thing you did in, in your homeworks, right? In, in all of our previous classes. So that, that should be familiar to you. What is next? Someone else. What is next? Come on. Bless you. Can you give me an answer? No? Come on, class. What is next? I have a user and I have a meetup. Yes, thank you. It's super straightforward. I'm going to do user.attend meetup. It's as simple as that because that's what we did before, right? That's how it should work. User.attend meetup. I told you this is not a trick question. This is literally what we did since the beginning of the class. User.attend meetup. And then let's send back the user, and it should work, right? Will it work? Will this work? Here. No? Why not? What? Tell me. We need to update the user in the database. Why do we do that? Because we haven't saved it. Ah, uh, you mean like here also save the user? Or where should I do it? Anyway, we're going to figure that out. Um, let's see if it's going to work. Let's run this. And it crashes. User.attend is not a function. Yes. So what I need to do is I'm going to go to person model and add this method. I didn't do that, right? I just have the definition here, the name and the and the age. I don't have the attend method here. I have to add it to this. And then it's going to work. Now, the way to, to do it is a little bit weird, let's say, in... Um, in Mongoose, and it is by writing the following person that schema methods that attend. 
okay, is a function. And then you can write whatever you want here. You can say console log hello and run this again. It will work. So this is how you add a new method. It cannot be a um, fat arrow function. It has to be the function declaration with the function keyword. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Unfortunately, um, I don't have the time to explain it, but you can read it. You can see why it doesn't work and read more about it. It has something to, to do with this, the value of this. Anyway, what did we do here before? What does the attend function do? Tell me. What did my attend function do before? Like in the previous classes, please. How do I add a, add the meetup to the uh, person's meetups? What 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 is the line that I type here? This dot. I'm on on the person model. This is the person. So this should be this dot meetups. Yes, meetups dot push. Exactly. Meetups dot push, and hopefully we have um, a meetup here, right? Attend takes in a parameter called meetup, right? And then we add it to a, to the list of meetups. Now this is also not going to work because we don't have a list of meetups. We need to create it. Meetups is an array, right? It's a list of items. So I'm going to put in square brackets to denote that it's an array. And then what is it? It's a meetup, right? Um, now there's a special way to denote this in MongoDB, in Mongoose. And generally, in databases, this is called a relation. A person model is related to the meetup model. A person model has several meetups, right? A meetup has several people, right? This, this is a relation. There are different types of relations, um, like one-to-one -one relation, one-to-many relation, long-distance relations. No, I'm kidding. Um, so. The way to define a relation in MongoDB or Mongoose specifically is with a special syntax again. Um, we're going to say the list of meetups is a list of object IDs with a reference to the meetup model. And you have to kind of know and remember how this works. So meetups, we will say, is an array of objects whose type is an object ID and whose reference is a meetup. All right? Now when we do this, it's going to work, hopefully. I added the meetups property. Now, let's first create a new person and see what happens. Mr. X, age 18, refresh this. Well, Mr. X has meetups. All of the other people have meetups as an array. So it's kind of working. Let's see if it works when we put um, meetups to to those. So attending a meetup, this that meetups push meetup. When I try to run this, it will feel like it's going to work. When I do this, it will feel like it's going to work. However, oh wait, it did work. Oh no, it didn't work. 
what's going on. So I added, let, let me try again. I'm making the call. In the data, Mart seems to have meetups, right? I got that back. Mart has meetups. Women Tech Makers Berlin. So this looks like it's legit. However, when I refresh, I don't see anything. The reason for that is, again, semantics. Um, whenever you have a model, Mongoose model, when you manipulate that model, you have to save it. If you don't save it, it's not going to work. And we can say this.save here. All right? When I do this, well, let's await the save. It's an async function, and we're awaiting save because obviously it's a remote operation, right? We're going to another server um, saving our data. Let's go back and run this, and let's refresh. And you have the meetups there. We have a meetup. That's an ID. That's OK. We're going to fix it in a, in a second. But now Mart is able to join a meetup. Isn't that cool? I mean, we did this with MongoDB. It's a real database. It's working. It's a relation that we set up. Cool. Um, what else do we do? Well, we can make sure that we have a proper meetup. We have a proper meetup uh, object here when we fetch the records. The way to do it is a different concept called population. Now, if you remember our struggle, why we imp implemented installed flatted was because we cannot really save data that depends on, on each other, right? A, like a person has a meetup, a meetup has people, those people have meetups as well. So there's a circular dependency, and our applications were crashing. That's why we implemented a library called flatted to be able to do that. Do you remember it? Do you remember it? A couple of people do. Perfect. Thank you. I, I appreciate the feedback. Um, now, MongoDB doesn't have that concept. It cannot work with circular data that's referencing each other. You cannot have people that have meetups that have people that have meetups. There has to be a limit somewhere. Um, that's why we only save the IDs of our relationships. So if Mart attended a meetup, we just save the ID of that meetup. And whenever we actually really need to see the names of those meetups that Mart attended, we go back and say, hey, can you populate the remaining details? Here is the ID of that meetup. Can you give me the rest of the details? OK. This is what you would hear as a join operation in other databases, in relational databases. It's almost like a join operation. There are a lot of de um, differences, of course, but it's very similar to that. Um, and obviously, we need a way to do that. Now, I'm going to show you a very hacky version. Don't type. Don't follow me here. Uh, I'm going to modify the base service and add something there. And I just wanted to show you that it's you know, easy to get this in MongoDB. You can do that population. It looks like your JSON that you saved in your database. The way I did it is by calling populate. Whenever I'm doing a find operation, okay, I'm telling MongoDB that, hey, please, could you also populate the field of meetups? Could you make sure? that the meetups properties of the people are, in fact, full with the details of each meetup. And it says, yeah, sure, I can do that. And it populates that field. How does it know where to populate? We tell it in the person model. We say the meetups property has a reference to the meetup model. And when we call populate, what we do is, what the application does is, or MongoDB or Mongoose, it looks at this meetup property, meetups property. Let me put it there. Um, I did it in, in base service. 
Yeah. So when we say populate meetups, the meetups is the name of the property. It checks the definition in the schema and say, okay, this is a ref reference to meetup. And I will go to the meetup model or the meetup collection and fetch the remaining details. Okay. This is very straightforward. Now, the reason I don't want you to follow me by writing this here is because I'm messing up with base service, which is the base for the meetup service as well. But meetup service or meetup model obviously doesn't have a list of meetups. This will only work for the person service, right? That's why we will delete this and do it properly. Now, while preparing for this course, I did a Google search, as I always do, and came up with a very useful library um, for MongoDB and for Mongoose, and that is auto population. Now, normally, whenever you're fetching data from the database, whenever you're fetching the person data from the database, you will always get a meetups array with just IDs in them. But that's annoying. What you would like to have is probably you want to get the, the details of the meetup every single time. If that is the case, then kind people on the internet made a very nice library plugin for us that we can use um, that I'm going to install and use right now that will automatically populate every single field that I, that I tell it to. So I'm going to install a new library, and it's called Mongoose Auto Populate. NPM install mongoose auto populate. Okay? And I install that. Then I'm gonna um, require it here after my schema definition. I will say person schema dot plugin require mongoose auto populate so just by adding a single line i'm adding new functionality to my mongoose library and that is auto population you know very easy the concept of a plugin can you tell me what a plugin is in your you know from your real life examples i know there are a couple of designers out here so probably they know what a what a uh, plugin is Raise your hands and tell me what a plugin is. Anybody? Are you not interested in the lecture anymore? Wait, you're talking. I want somebody who didn't um, talk at all during the class. Please tell me what a plugin is or what you think a plugin is. I was talking about you. You are talking. I want someone else. You know, a new face, please. I have all night. Oh, yeah, perfect. What is a plugin? A piece of code that someone else wrote that I put it into my code to do a specific function. Yes. Um, can you give me an example of a plugin from a real life application, please? Perfect. For example, Photoshop has plugins. This is what I was looking for. Um, there are hundreds of effects in Photoshop. But it's not enough. It's never enough. And you can go to the market and buy new plugins. You don't have to change Photoshop. Not everybody has it. You can buy it separately, plug it into Photoshop, and just use it. It's like installing a font. A font is also a plugin for a replication. So it's additional functionality that doesn't require you to change your own work, the, the work that you did. I'm requiring a new plugin and introducing it to mongoose here to do auto population right and then the only thing that i need to do in order to use that plugin is to add auto populate true here let's see let's run this um, i i removed the the populate from the find call i go back refresh it and it's there so i just said Hey, could you always populate this meetups property for me? And Mongoose will handle it automatically. Great. Let's let me quickly do the same thing for the meetup model. I'm gonna, of course, copy and paste this plugin. 
and I'm going to replace the person, the word person, with meetup here. I'm missing something in this attend function. Can anybody tell me? This is not the end of the attend function. There's something else that I need to do with it. Anyone? What am I missing in the attend function on the left? I have to. I have to add to the meetup the person that visited the meetup, right? Um, so the meetup should also have a list of attendees. If you remember that part from the, the previous week, or weeks, literally again, since four weeks we're talking about the same example, a meetup has a list of attendees. So what I should do here is I should add a new property to the meetup schema called attendees, right? That will be an array, right? Because it's multiple people. An array of what? An array of objects. And tell me what I need to type inside. The name of the attendees. This is the definition of the schema. I don't know. There, there is no meetup yet. I, I just want to tell Mongoose that we will have an array of attendees that will be probably people. How do I do that? What do I need to type here to make it work? We have what? Yeah, exactly. We're doing like we did in the person. We're going to say type. Mongoose schema types object ID. Unfortunately, this is the only way to get the actual real object ID type. Um, and ref, what am I going to type here? Person. Great. I'm, I'm saying that this is a list of people. Unfortunately, English doesn't allow us to say persons. We should be more correct. Now, if you refresh the meetup, Sorry for blinding you. If you refresh the meetup, you're going to see that attendees right now is, a, um, is an empty array. We didn't record it yet. How am I going to do it? What did I do before? What, what is the line that I need to type here? Meetup.attendees push. This, perfect. This ID. Um, did did we do it like that before? In in the first weeks. Yeah, a very very good point. So in the first weeks, we just did this. This meetups push meetup meetup attendees push this. Right. This is literally ten times in the repository already, um, and this worked. And I want this to work here as well. I don't want to compromise. Even though we're just saving the ID of the people or ID of the meetup in our relations, I want this to work. And people who were developing Mongoose were so kind. They changed the push function. This is not a regular array push. This is a specific push function for Mongoose objects. They changed the push function. And what they did is whenever you're pushing an object, if it has an ID in it, it takes that ID and saves that, and not the whole object. So kind of abstracts some functionality. You can just push an ID as well. That's, that's also going to work. But it's much easier to follow when you type this. And you also have the, um, the benefit that this piece of code, again, doesn't care if it's MongoDB or not. This piece of code, this the contents of the attend function doesn't care which database it is. You can copy paste, and this would work between your file operations, your MongoDB operations, and any database that you write. This should work. This is a very nice way of software architecture and abstraction. You shouldn't care with the implicit details or intricate details of each implementation. So this should work. Um, will it work? How, do the, how does JavaScript know if I used array push or a special push? Well, it asks this object, this attendees object, or this meetups object. It says, give me the method called push. And if in that object there's a special override of push, you're going to end up with that override. 
If there's no override, it's going to ask the parent of that object. It will say, give me the push function. And um, you know, then, it will, then you will get the regular array push. Any, any other questions? You had a question. You don't, yeah, you had a question before. You don't? Perfect. Yeah, maybe you do. Great, tell me. Perfect. Wow. Amazing question. Thank you. I'm really, really happy to, to receive this question because that's what we're going to do next. You predicted the future. Um, the question is, this is a function, right? Why do we put this in the person schema, person model, and not into the service? I'm going to explain it in a little bit why we will do that. But the reason for why we did it this way is because this function was in person model before. If you go back to the previous example, week three example, you're going to see that this function was in the person model. Let me open that again. See, this is the person model. And the attend function was inside the person model. I just wanted to follow uh, the same, same structure. But in like two sentences, I'm going to change this. <laughs> so thank you. Tell me what is missing here. This is not going to work for the meetup. It's going to work for the people. It's not going to work for the meetups. Am I missing one more line? Tell me what it is. Who said that? I have to save it. Yes, thank you very much. You're saving the day. Yes, I have to save the meetup as well. So I'm awaiting meetup.save. OK, now let's see. Now let's make um, Jason attend the same meetup. I'm taking the ID of Jason. I'm pasting in in the person's ID. The meetup ID is the same. Let's refresh this. Oh, wait, Jason couldn't attend that meetup. What happened? Did he crash? He crashed. Oh. Perfect. Validation. Person validation failed. Age is required. Jason doesn't have an age. So let's try it with Mr. T. Jason cannot attend the meetup. Doesn't have an age. Let's try it with Mr. T. Mr. T was unable to attend the meetup. Why is that? Because age 0 is less than minimum allowed value 18, right? So that also won't work. Let's try with Mr. Z and see if they will work. Let's refresh this. And Mr. Z is able to attend the meetup. Now, this is extremely important. This is validations at work. I had old records in my database. I'm not able to save them anymore. I am not able to change them until you go and fix the problem with them, until you update their age to be more than 18 or equal to 18, um, I cannot save them anymore. I had to use another, another object. This is why validations are super, super important and super useful. You can say, these are the rules. I'm blocking all the operations to save or change any objects until you fix this issue, um, which is really cool. So let's go back to the meetups. Let's refresh it. Now I see the attendees. Attendees is, again, an ID in the meetups. Why is it an ID and not an object? What? What? We forgot auto. I mean, of course, we didn't forget it. <laughs> we didn't put in auto populate. So let's say here auto populate true. OK? Let's go back and refresh. Oh, oh my god. What's going on here? What am I seeing here? What is this? It's what? It's looping. What is this crazy thing over here? Um, if you remember what I said, Mongo will populate every single field, right? when we want auto-populate true, when we say auto-populate true, it will populate every single field. So 
let's go we and we started with the meetup we're requesting a meetup and we told it to auto populate the attendees so it did that it said okay here's the first attendee who has a list of meetups which is a person and then we said hey whenever you're finding people populate them and it said okay then i'm going to populate meetups which is a object of meetup which has a list of attendees which has a list of people which has a list of meetups so that's why we have this and obviously we have 10 of them here the reason for that is because uh, the developers of this library auto populate library foresaw that this would happen and kept it at 10 10 populations they said you know if you really have more than 10 populations you're doing something really wrong please change your code <laughs> okay and um what they do is they cap it limited at 10 populations up to 10 populations you're going to get repeated objects so you can do attendees zero that meetup zero that attendees zero that meetup zero and you can you can find your way through it um you can change it i don't like this at all like one population should be enough let's say two populations at most for your projects should be enough and i need to make that happen the way to do that is come on i don't want you the way to do that is to change this auto populate into an object now if it was true before I change it with a configuration object and say max depth equals one. Max depth equals one. Obviously, I don't know these things off the top of my head. I just learned them by reading the documentation. I did a Google search, ended up with the library, saw that it would be really useful, tried it, it was working, and then searched for the depth. You refresh it, and now you see a very, very nice object. Here as well, when we refresh it, we see only one um, meetup. If we say max step 10 and go back and refresh this, this is going to go crazy. You know, obviously, this is not something we want. For every person, it will fetch meetups 10 times. For all of those meetups, it will fetch people 10 times. We don't want that. One or at most two for our applications should be enough it looks super nice do you agree you don't have to be polite you can definitely be like that person over there and say no <laughs> just kidding um for me this is very impressive we do this with a very simple database with minimal code okay this is why we choose JavaScript. This is why we choose MongoDB and no other technologies. It's very simple, very straightforward to write code. We have 15 minutes, and I'm going to talk about one more thing. But before that, let me tell you about another concept called signal to noise ratio. Any electronics engineers over here? Anybody who knows what a signal to noise ratio is? Can you tell us what it is in like? A sentence <laughs> it tells you how well you can see or detect something perfect um, it is the quality ratio of your actual signal it could be a picture it could be a mp3 file it could be a phone call anything is a signal in this world even light is a signal it's a wave um, and its difference to noise is that <laughs> sound that you hear or it's grain in your pictures when you take a picture in a very dark location you you see a lot of grain there right um, or it's a blur in your pictures when you take a picture again sometimes it's very blurry those are the noise and the, the the sound of of the AC, they're all noises. White noise. Yeah. I could actually never learn the difference between white noise, pink noise, and, and all the others. Um, but there's a concept called signal 
to noise ratio. And that is how quality uh, your signal is. And we have that concept for code as well. If you have any experience with any other language, um, to get this functionality, you write a lot of code, like maybe 10 times more code. In programming, signal to noise ratio is the number of characters that you have to type to get a functionality done. To do a lot of work, we write very little code. To do population, we just say auto-populate true. That does so many different things. You have to write so many lines of code in other languages to get that functionality. That's why the signal to noise ratio of JavaScript is very, very high. Um, if you go to the Meetup service here, you know, just doing this, I'm increasing the signal to noise ratio by writing this. Previously, I had this, right? Constructor. This model equals Meetup model. Do you remember this? from like 20 minutes ago. These two were the same. Line 7, 8, and 9 are equal to line 5. And my goal was to simplify this, to remove noise from my code. And I said, OK, this is noise. I know that it's a constructor. I don't need it. I know that it's a function. I don't need it. OK? I know that I'm adding things to my instance by doing this. I don't need it. And I remove it is what I end up with. Only by writing the name of the property and the name meetup model, I can achieve the same functionality. So I'm increasing the signal to noise ratio. This is, a, um, this is a very advanced topic. I just wanted to talk about it to make you aware of it. W whatever language that you're writing your code in, front end, back end, doesn't matter. You should make sure you have a very high signal to noise ratio. Prefer languages that have high signal to noise ratio. By writing only a couple of letters, you get work done. The best work is done without any effort. You know, if you don't write any code and it still works, then that is the best, of course. Um, but we're trying to minimize what we write. Okay, now the final topic before we wrap up is in person model what you said isn't this a function why are we keeping in in person model the problem here is that the attend method on a person object dictates a couple of things it dictates that this is the final thing that i want to do with my person and i should save that person you know there won't be any other modifications in the person object, and I should immediately save it, which will make another call to a database. Another problem is it's messing up with meetup. It's modifying meetup, and it's saving a meetup. Now, that's very dangerous. That's a lot of dependencies between two different teams, because remember, each file is owned by a different team. So you are literally changing the operation of another team. You say, I'm the developer of the person, service or person model and i want to be able to attend the meetup and you have to also save yourself because i modify you this is very um at first it's very intuitive but it's also self-entitled i could say who are you to change a meetup you cannot do that. That's not your responsibility. That's not the responsibility of a person. So that is the only reason for why this is not a good place. This is a cross-functional problem, OK? It's a cross-functional problem in that we need to change a person and we need to change a meetup. It cannot happen in one of the functions. It can only happen at a higher function, at a higher level. A level that knows both of these functions, that can access both of these functions independently. This is what I'm going to do next. I will keep um, person service here, OK? And I will add a new method to it. I will say 
attend meetup this time. I will call it attend meetup. It will take in a person and it will take in a meetup. And here, let me copy paste this code. I will say person meetups attend, uh, person meetups push meetup, meetup attendees push person, await person save, await meetup save. This is much better. Now, the person model has given away a lot of responsibility that it cannot really carry. Okay? Models should never depend on each other, they should never mess with each other. Services can, and that is why we need a service. Services can deal with multiple different models, a person model and a meetup model. They are the bridge, the link between two different entities. So whenever you have any business logic, you need to implement it in your services. Okay? And how do I do this in my route, person route? I will do... I will find these instead of user that at end I say person service await person service that attend person meetup. Okay? And then it's gonna work. Let's try that. Let's try to have oops. There's an error in my code. Await is only well it's in an async function here. Yeah. What? Attend meetup. Thank you. The the method is called attend meetup, not attend. Still crashed. Person is not defined. We should pass in user. This is how I'm debugging things in real life. And this is how you should be doing it as well. Um, this person will attend the same meetup. Let's run it again, refresh, and you see they attended the same meetup again. Mr. Z attended the same meetup, Wayfair meetup again. So it worked. This is how you should be implementing your business logic in services, not in models. Models can have functionality, of course. They can have methods that are only related to themselves. You know, a person might be there. there there's an uh, there was a homework. People were looking for peers, and they would join in groups and, and do certain activities together. A person might be searching for a peer, for a friend, for another person, you know, with certain properties by their name, if they're, um, you know, more than 20 years old or something. Um, let's, in fact, do that. Let's add a method to the person model. I'm going to do person schema dot methods dot find peers over, I don't know, 18, right? I want this to be a function. What I'm going to type here is a query that will fetch me the people over 18. Let's go to person route and add a new URL for this router.get the user ID peers over 18, let's say. This is a route handler. I get the user and then I say user dot find peers over 18. Let's say this is the list of peers, and then I'm sending the peers back to the to the front end. Okay. Return hello, something like that. If I call it here, axios.get a person peers over 18. I'm going to end up with hello. So it's working. I added a function and I sent hello. Now let's write the query here. This operation is a search operation, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to write this.find. 
I want people, I want to find people over 18 whose age is, let's say, 18 for now. This will give me the list of people who are Hmm. Wait, this that find is not a function. Um, no, this should be fine. What am I doing wrong here? What? No, that should be in um, in the person. object um it should be person schema that methods i mean we, we did this right with with this one this meetups push okay yeah Yeah, cool. I actually need to call the model um, to be able to do that. So it's either this dot constructor dot find or person model dot find. Yeah, I'm sure there's another way of doing it. Um, I'm I'm gonna find it and send it over to you. The data that I get is basically two people that are at the age of 18, Mr. Z and Mr. X, right? That works. Now, I want people who are over 18, and the query for that is the following. I say, find me people with age with a condition greater than 18. $GT is a MongoDB operator. So whenever um, you're implementing your homeworks, find an opportunity to use, to use an operator. You can look these up in MongoDB documentation. There are tons of other different operators, like less than, less than and equal to, greater than and equal to, size, um, and several others that I cannot really remember well. But you can, you can do it, you know, right now when I call this, I will get multiple people. I'm um, sorry, I, I'm going to get only one person that's over 35 because I'm not counting the people that are 18 years old. In order to do that, I need to change this to GTE greater than or equal to. And when I save this and call this functionality again, I'm going to get three people. One people who is 35, two people who are 18. Okay, so this is an, a, a way to implement a functionality in um, in the person model. Now, one could argue that this would this could also go to the person service, which is also legit. You can use the person service for this as well. This doesn't have to be inside the person model. What really has to go inside the person model is very delicate. Some software architects say you should have no methods here. No methods should be in person model. Some people say when it's simple, you can have it. When it's referring only to itself as a model, then you can have it. Um, I'm switching camps all the time. Sometimes I'm like, no, models cannot really have any methods because it's business functionality and it should live in services. Sometimes I say, you know what? Yeah, it's okay, it's fine. Um, all right, this is, what did I do? <laughs> this is what I wanted to tell you today. I'm one minute over. Um, this is what I wanted to tell you today about the lecture. MongoDB, um, relationships, population, and some advanced query mechanisms. I talked about software architecture, what we prefer to implement, what we, how we want to implement these functionalities. I said we should use a base service, and I said we should use services, and that's going to be your homework. You need to implement services for all of your business models, objects and move all of your business functionality over to URLs, accessible over URLs, and implement them in services. You can ask us 
what should my URL look like? I'm trying to achieve this functionality. What should my URL look like? Getting the URLs right is a little bit tough. Will you put in column ID, column ID? Will you put it slash meetups? It's very difficult, and we can help you out with that. Um, how do you feel? Overwhelmed. OK. I'm going to tell you one more thing that will confuse you even further. Yeah, it's going to be overflowing. Now, when I talked about not putting the attend under person model, I said this is doing too much work, right? It's accessing the, the, uh, the meetup and saving the meetup as well. And I said, this is not OK. It's not OK to do. And then I moved that functionality to person service. And there, I'm changing meetup. This is not OK. Because this is a person service. A person service can do stuff related to people. It's best if it doesn't know another service. Just because of the name. The name is a person service. So it shouldn't mess with meetups or any other entities. But what are we going to do? We want this functionality. We have to implement it somewhere, right? The way to implement it is to introduce a new service, which I'm not going to write today. But apparently, we have this burning need to update both users and meetups at the same time. For what reason? What is the reason? What is the feature that we want to implement? Attending. Attendance, right? Apparently, we have a business use case where people can attend meetups. This calls for an attendance service, where you reference only the attendance service, give the IDs of the user and the meetup, not even the user and meetup models, objects. The attendance service then finds those users and meetups from referencing by referencing individual services the attendance service references person service fetches the person references meetup service fetches the meetup and then makes these two interact with each other they shouldn't interact directly with each other yes there must be a um a what? A junction. A mediatory. Well, no, there, what was the right word? A mediating mediator, intermediate, um, intermediary um, service called attendance service. If that is your business object or if, this is, if that is your business functionality. Okay. Now, this is a very advanced topic. I don't expect you to do this in your homeworks. Obviously, if you do it, the better. But I don't want to overwhelm you further. So I won't require this to see in your homeworks. But I just wanted to tell you how real proper software architecture is always done. Um, so that you know, when you go to and work for other companies as software engineers, you can pinpoint and say, ha, you're doing it wrong. I know a better way. Um, yeah. The what? The save will happen there, yes. I mean, person service can save its own entities. You can have save method here in the person service, and the intermediate uh, service can call it. But the functionality will, should be there, should, it, should be the, in the intermediate service. If you want to do everything right, according to the book, you should introduce another service. It's more code. It's definitely increasing signal-to-noise ratio, because we could have the same functionality here. But it's better architecture, because Multiple teams will maintain these things. And we don't want dependencies. We don't want our business objects to depend on other things. We want higher level entities that we didn't think before, like attendance service, to know these things and implement that functionality there. I'm way over time. Thank you for listening to me today. But more, more importantly, most importantly, thank you for listening to Maya today. That was an amazing lecture from her. So today, the applause is for Maya again. Thank you. And see you next week.